Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Mike Clare. I am the Associate Director for Public Policy at the Harris Center, which is here at Memorial University. Delighted to be here to, and see such a large group who is here with me in the business boardroom on the St. John's campus, as well as those of you who are watching online. So welcome to everybody. We're talking about the Canada-European Union Trade Agreement, uh, an agreement that uh, we've been talking about for a long time, uh, but uh, we've only heard rumors. It, it's like this mythic, mythical beast that existed somewhere. Uh, we've asked lots of questions over the years about where it was and who, you know, what, what it included and all that. Uh, and so finally, we're delighted today to have two people who will come to, who know the agreement inside and out, who are, have agreed to come here and share their knowledge with us. So we're very happy to be the host here today. And thank you guys for inviting the Harris Center to be a part of this. Uh, to give you an idea of who is here in the room with, with us, uh, why don't we go around the room and ask everybody to introduce themselves. And we'll start with Tansy, and then I'll read off the list of the people who are watching online as well. Please, uh, please use the microphone so people online can hear you. I'm Tansy Munden, Director of Communications with the Department of Business, Tourism, Culture, and Rural Development. Hi, uh, John Duff, uh, Projects Office Coordinator here at the Harris Center. Hello, I'm Morgan Murray. I'm the uh, Coordinator of Strategic External Relations here at MUN. Hi, I'm Marilyn Reed, a concerned citizen, and I'm with uh, the Council of Canadians. <clears throat> uh, I'm Erin Keogh, and I'm a consultant in things related to rural delivery via internet and other communications. Sharon Butchkovsky, I'm a retired teacher and interested, very interested in what's going on. And I'm Richard Butchkovsky, retired federal civil servant. My name is Oleg Dajou. I'm studying uh, fisheries here. Uh, Russell Williams, Department of Political Science. Mark James, Manager of Trade Negotiations with Business, Tourism, Culture, and Rural Development. Derek Butler with the Association of sea Seafood Producers. Kerry Banal, I'm the head of the School of Fisheries at the Fisheries and Marine Institute of Memorial. Gerald Anderson, Director of Development and Engagement at the Marine Institute. Uh, hey, we're Blake. I'm with the Faculty of Education. I'm also a town councillor in Harbour Grace. I'm Glenn Blackwood, I'm Vice President Memorial, responsible for the Fisheries and Marine Institute. Uh, John Abbott, um, advisory board here at the Harris Center, among other things, and a management consultant here in the city. David Verdi, a retired public servant. Osvaldo Croce, political science man. Winston Finder, retired public servant. Gus Echegari from the Fisheries uh, Community Alliance. And I will introduce these two gentlemen in a moment. And there's uh, one other person, two other people have come in. Uh, Johan Johansson from the Fisheries Union and Joella Coyne from the DFA. So welcome everybody. And we also have Taylor Stock here who is uh, doing the webcast. Thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, online, we have David Chandy of the, of the uh, APEC, Atlantic Provinces Economic Council. Welcome, David. Anastasia Day with the Government of Canada. Sue Doyle with Eastern Health, Bill Hind, Newfoundland Labrador Federation of Labor, Louise Laflamme, Transport Canada, Peter McIntyre, Forestry and Agri-Foods Agency, and Caroline Walsh, Government of Newfoundland Labrador. So really happy to see all of you who are here and all of you who are watching. And I do want to recognize uh, uh, John Abbott, who's a member of the advisory board, as he said, and Dave Vardy, who is an associate of the Hair Center. So very happy to have you here. We're going to start with about a 15 or 20 minute presentation by our two presenters, and then it'll be free for all Fridays. Uh, if you have any, we'll engage in a discussion session till about 3.30 uh, when these two gentlemen have to leave. Uh, so uh, try to keep your questions short and to the point and so that we can engage as many questions as possible. And uh, at the Harris Center, we work more with light than with heat. Uh, and so uh, we like passion, but we also like reason. And so let's, uh, make sure that your questions have a particular point, your comment has a particular point so that our people can address them. So CETA is a complex topic. Uh, we're pretty sure we're going to generate a lot of discussions about that. Um, so any questions before we start? Does that sound like the meeting that you signed up for? Good. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. In early 2009, Steve Verhul was appointed Canada's chief trade negotiator for nego negotiations between Canada and the European Union. 
in the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Prior to that appointment, he was at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for 20 years, where he worked on the NAFTA negotiations, the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations that led to the establishment of the World Trade Organization, and the Doha round of WTO negotiations. He was Canada's chief agriculture negotiator from 2003 to 2009, responsible for leading Canada's involvement in international trade negotiations on agriculture, including at the WTO. Steve graduated from the University of Western Ontario in 1984 after obtaining Bachelor and Master of Arts degrees in political science. So that's Steve on your right. Uh, Jeff, uh, immediately next to me, joined the government of Newfoundland and Labrador in 2010 to negotiate the Canada-European Union Comprehensive and Trade Agreement. Mr. Loder was the province's lead negotiator for CETA and is the current lead negotiator for the renegotiation of the Agreement on Internal Trade. He is the Director for Trade Policy in the Department of Business, Tourism, Culture and, and Rural Development. Uh, he graduated from Memorial University in 2006 after obtaining a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Master of Arts degree in Political Science. He's also studied at McMaster University and the University of Leiden. So I'm uh, delighted to host this session today and please join me in welcoming our two presenters today. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for meeting with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. I've done quite a few discussions about CETA in various configurations, both across Canada and in the European Union. Uh, received many different points of view, uh, uh, many different uh, reactions, but um, generally I think that uh, we have an agreement here that's uh, it's a quite groundbreaking in many ways, and I think that um, uh, it has the potential to significantly change uh, not only our economic relationship with the European Union, but also our overall relationship. And that's something that uh, we've seen evidence, uh, particularly in the last number of months. But just as a, a little background to start with, Canada wanted a free trade agreement with the European Union for a very long time, uh, some 35 years. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that in particular. Uh, we wanted to reduce our over-reliance on the U.S. market to some degree. Uh, Europe was a natural ally in that respect because we have a lot of common history. We have a lot of uh, points of, of uh, commonality when it comes to culture, values, uh, the way we view the role of government. Uh, it was a natural. And of course, the EU is, um, by a significant margin, the largest economy in the world. It's the largest importer of products in the world. It's the largest exporter. Uh, it's the largest investor. It's the largest destination of investment. And it's not only a large market in itself, but it's also a gateway to uh, markets across the world because there are more Fortune 500 companies established in the EU than there are anywhere else in the world, including the US. Uh, so we not only uh, gain access to the EU market, but we gain access to all of the other markets that the EU is involved in. So um, the negotiation did take a very long time, as these negotiations usually go, uh, more than five years to include this negotiation. Uh, that included uh, no breakdowns, no pauses. That was continual negotiations from the, the time we began until the time we finished. Um, that is unusual. And uh, the, probably the main reason that it took so long was because, in part, we wanted to ensure that we were going to have a high level of ambition in this agreement. We wanted to go well beyond where we had gone in previous agreements because we thought uh, if we were really going to make a difference in our economic relationship in particular, then we had to go much further than we had in other agreements. And we were both of that view um, when we started negotiating. It was also more complicated because in many ways what we were trying to do was we were trying to build a bridge between a North American model when it comes to trade agreements um, and the European model, which was largely about uh, the European Union common internal market. Uh, so that involved uh, creating a lot of new approaches to issues that we had neither of us had ever, ever tried before. Uh, that also meant that we took uh, some additional time. The other element that uh, was somewhat novel was that we 
both had similar views on what a trade agreement should look like or or a comprehensive economic and trade agreement because this is a bit beyond a trade agreement in many ways. And we wanted it to be in many ways progressive as well. So we put more emphasis on issues like labor and the environment that we would ordinarily do, sustainable development. Uh, we made sure that public services were carved out of the agreement, uh, social services, uh, public health, safety, protection of the environment, social services, all of that as well as culture. Um, and that was fairly easy to do with a trading partner that had a common view on many of those issues. So um, when it comes to CETA, the, the CETA really was groundbreaking in many respects. And we started out from a fairly strong position. The EU is our second largest trade and investment partner behind only the US. Now, at the moment, it's a long ways behind the US, but it is our second largest uh, trade and investment partner. And in fact, a single EU country, uh, the Netherlands, is the second largest investor in Canada after the US. Um, so you can see that there's a, a strong relationship there. Uh, Two-way merchandise trade uh, is about $100 billion annually. Two-way services trade is close to $40 billion. Um, so we are starting from a, a fairly significant base. Uh, Canadian investment in the EU is about $208 billion. Uh, in EU investment in Canada is about $242 billion. So you can see, particularly in the investment numbers, that uh, on a relative basis, we're investing a lot more in the EU than they are in Canada. Um, that's indicating that the, the relationship as it stands now is more about investment than it is about trade. Uh, but with a trade agreement like CETA, uh, we would expect that relationship to change somewhat. Um, so the EU, as I mentioned, is a very large market, 500 million consumers, uh, a GDP of over $20 trillion. Again, both of those largest market in the world, both financially and by, by size. And with CETA, assuming we can get through the remaining stages of implementation, uh, we will have a first mover advantage over other countries seeking to have similar access. And uh, we will have virtually tariff free access to the EU market. And the EU does, have, does tend to have higher tariffs and a broader tariff coverage than most developed countries. So this will be a significant uh, advantage for us. And it's not only a matter of getting rid of some of the, the tariffs that are prohibitive in the EU, which tend to be more in agriculture and in fish and some, some industrial products, uh, but it's also getting rid of tariffs in the range of 10, 15, 20 percent, because those can provide a real advantage to Canadian exporters, uh, and not to mention uh, helping with their bottom line. Um, so I think that uh, with uh, the CETA with the EU, we also put ourselves in a very strategic position because we would be really the only country that would have an ambitious agreement with the European Union and an ambitious agreement with the US. That will tend to position Canada extremely well in terms of investment attraction, in terms of our ability to enter both markets, in terms of value chains, and uh, that is expected to give us a, a significant advantage. Now, the US and EU are also negotiating, as you may be aware. Um, they're somewhat behind where we are. They're still in what I would characterize as relatively early stage of negotiations because they haven't crunched the most difficult issues yet. Um, but you can imagine the position that we would be in if the US and EU reached an agreement and we did not have an agreement because not only would we lose any preference to the US and the EU market, we would lose our preference into the U.S. market to the, to the EU as well, uh, which would mean the economic impact on us would be very, very significantly negative. So, um, so with respect to CETA, there are potential benefits to all sectors of the economy, from primary producers and agriculture was a, was a key interest in the negotiations, as was fish and seafood as with the, the forestry industry and many others, metals and minerals, all of 
those were of significant interest. Um, but what we've also gained into the EU market, and this is uh, of particular significance, is that we gained access to the value added portion of the market as well. Because the EU tends to have their protections at the border relatively lower on inputs or on products that aren't that processed or resources that they need. Those tariffs get higher the further processing is added. If you take a, an area like fish, for example, they have end use restrictions on imports of fish, say from Canada. They do not allow you to uh, access the retail market. Uh, it only allows you to get into the, whole, the, into the wholesale market, and that's as far as you can get. So you can't brand your product, you can't label your product, you can't develop a market. All of that will be removed when seed is into effect, and we will be able to get right to the retail market and start putting our product on the shelf. And uh, that's going to be a significant advantage as well and allow us to start producing and selling more and more value-added products. Um, we also negotiated a number of firsts in the agreement uh, with the EU. And part of this was because, as I mentioned, we were developing a, this bridge between a North American approach and an EU approach. And it, it's a fairly long list, uh, although some of them are somewhat technical issues. Uh, on services, for example, for the first time ever, the EU used a, a negative list approach to uh, uh, to confirming their services obligations, which means essentially that everything is covered by the agreement unless you specifically provide an exception. With a positive type approach, um, you only list those areas where you're prepared to take commitments. So you end up with much more ambition with a negative list for the most part, and you end up with much more transparency. The EU, as of yet, has not given the, the uh, negative list approach to the US, and I don't think they intend to. Um, CETA was the first time the EU negotiated investment rules on an EU-wide basis, and uh, first time they've incorporated mutual recognition of conformity assessment procedures, which means that if you, you need a product certified in the EU market, you no longer have to send that product to the EU, have it certified, bring it back with all of the costs associated with all of that. You'll be able to get that product certified to EU standards within Canada um, by Canadian bodies. And that's never been done before um, with the EU. Uh, we also have extensive provisions on regulatory cooperation to try and address issues related to standards. And we've gone further than we ever have before on on the level of ambition on goods, on services, on investment. Uh, the EU services market is some $12 trillion. Um, it's a huge market, again, largest in the world. They, we have full access to their government procurement market at every level, from the EU-wide level to the member state level, to the regional government level, to the municipal level. Canadians will be able to compete on a level playing field with EU uh, companies in any procurement pro uh, contract within the EU. Um, and that's, as I mentioned, a $3.3 trillion market. Um, we also did a number of things on our side, uh, and that includes, for the first time, taking on specific oblig obligations at the provincial and territorial level. We've never done that before. Um, and that has, uh, has um, has meant that we have gone far beyond where we went in NAFTA as well, because we attempted that in NAFTA and failed. Um, part of the reason that the provinces and territories played such a significant role in the seated negotiations, and that too was unprecedented, was because we were negotiating some element at the provincial and territorial level in a much more in-depth way than we ever had before. Um, and that's why provinces, provincial representatives were at the table at the negotiating table on issues that fell under their jurisdiction. They were part of the Canadian negotiating team throughout. We've never done that before, or we've never done it since. Um, but that contributed to the kind of results that we managed to succeed. Um, now, looking forward a bit, I mentioned that the US and EU are continuing to negotiate. 
if the EU and US succeed and they, uh, they reach an agreement, we built a number of provisions into CETA that would then allow us to expand that into a North American EU free trade area, which would provide us even greater benefits. However, if the US and EU don't succeed, then we will have a continued significant advantage over US exporters into the EU market. Uh, so in either way that works, uh, we're gonna come out uh, significantly ahead. And then finally, just with respect to next steps, we, we finished the negotiations on August 14th, uh, sorry, on August uh, 2014, uh, some time ago, but it's taken a while to get through the next steps. We completed the review of the legal text on February 29th of this year. Uh, so we do have a final legal text. We're now finalizing the translation and we do have to translate CETA into uh, the EU's other 22 um, uh, treaty languages. So the agreement has to be equally enforceable, equally legally valid in all 23 languages. So it's important we get those translations right. We should be finished that in the next two to three weeks. Then it will go through the approval process in the EU, first through the European Commission, which will be fairly straightforward, uh, then through the Council of the EU, which includes representatives from all 28 EU member states. Uh, then we expect to uh, have a signature of the final legal agreement sometime in October at a summit uh, that will be held in Europe uh, at the uh, prime minister president level. And then uh, the agreement will go to the European Parliament, where a simple majority is needed. And uh, once they ratify it, uh, we can then move towards uh, implementation. It's likely to be what the EU would call a mixed agreement, which means some elements of the agreement come under EU jurisdiction, some elements come under member state jurisdiction, but about 90 to 95% of it will be under EU jurisdiction they can implement that almost immediately, and we anticipate that will happen in early 2017. Those areas that fall under member state ratification will require uh, member states to ratify, all 28 of them, um, but that usually happens over a period of time, occasionally three to four years. We'll be less concerned about that because, as I said, that will only concern five, perhaps a little bit more percent of the entire agreement. So that's kind of an overview of the uh, of some of the context and the next steps. Uh, from here, I'll leave it to Jeff to talk about more specific uh, issues of interest in Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you, Steve, uh, and thank you for coming today uh, to do this. We have a busy schedule. I just wanted to start off by sort of putting the presentation into the context. Some of you know we're uh, currently hosting. Uh, the European Union in the province. We have 24 EU ambassadors here, including the EU ambassador uh, uh, Konex, uh, for a couple of days. Uh, they uh, chose to come to Newfoundland as one of, uh, as an annual or biannual uh, sort of reach out in Canada as a group. Uh, so there's a, quite a big delegation here for the next couple of days. And uh, Steve uh, was agreeable to come down to be a part of that and uh, participate in some business panels and so forth. So we thought it would be a good idea to uh, do something here at the university and kind of take sort of a technical uh, review of CETA and go through what uh, the agreement really does. So in terms of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, just sort of the general context on the, on the good side, on the tariff side, there's really three, I think, key things. Uh, first is that essentially all tariffs uh, on products going into the European uh, Union market from Canada uh, will be going to duty free, 98% uh, on day one. 1% uh, will be phased out over seven years. And then there will be 1% which is, does not go to duty free, and that's largely beef, pork, and supply managed products, uh, federal government. And uh, I would say most provinces uh, felt the protection of uh, that industry in Canada uh, uh, was very important. Uh, two other aspects on the goods side before going into more specifically into sectors on goods. Uh, clear and favorable rules of origin. Uh, there were a number, a number of parts of this agreement where uh, the negotiators were able to get favorable rules of origin for Canada, which would allow Can Canadian companies and business uh, to import products from outside the country, both in terms of machinery and manufacturer products, have them assembled in Canada, and then still export it to the EU at duty-free. 
likewise for fish and seafood and as well as other sectors where there's some ability to take raw product in from the US and other uh, destinations, uh, origins, and sorry, and bring them in, transform them, and send them into the European Union duty free. And this was a big part of the negotiations uh, because, of course, there are supply chains uh, throughout North America. And uh, a lot of the, uh, particularly the fish and seafood sector, but other sectors that operate ac across North America. Customs and trade facilitation, and this is part of, a, I think, of a, a broader overall package, which I'll come back to later, uh, is one of those sort of uh, uh, what I would call non-tariff <laughs> uh, issues, which are critical for what, at least in our world, we call real market access. One thing the, to have a measure at the border that you have to pay a tariff or some border measure. But there's all kinds of flexibility, both at the border and inside uh, any market, to prevent markets from really be, uh, from products and services to be able to be delivered. And on the good side, in this agreement, it allows for advanced ruling, rulings on origin and tariff classification, which is very important. So you don't make a mistake thinking you can get a product in duty free uh, because you've transformed it three times when you're only allowed to do two things to the product. Um, as well as there's going to be a number of initiatives to uh, uh, make all border measures automatic. And uh, so as an overall package, this is from a broad, this is really sort of as well as the Canadian, as well as Newfoundland perspective, uh, it's essentially will be duty free access to the European market. In particular to Newfoundland and Labrador, and I, I've singled out three here, uh, metal and mineral products, uh, fish and seafood, uh, and government procurement. Uh, yeah and forestry. First, on metal and mineral products, while most of our natural resource products like oil and, and their sort of base uh, state were going into the EU duty-free, there were a number of other products uh, uh, that weren't, including things like aluminum and other advanced miner uh, mineral products and processed products that will now be able to go in duty-free, and that has implications for investment in the province's various sectors. There are various manufactured metal products iron, steel tube, pipe fittings, which the province uh, is in that sector. Uh, so this really solidifies uh, our access in this area. Uh, other sectors, like sea and fish and seafood, it was more than just about maintaining a certain level of access or guaranteed access or getting some improvements. On fish and seafood, uh, the province was largely shut out of the European market in many ways through prohibitive tariffs ranging up to 25%. But as Steve said earlier, one of the major issues, and this has been a long standing issue between the federal government and the province and the EU, uh, it's their uh, uh, end use restrictions. So you were permitted to export products into the EU in block form or bulk form, uh, but you could not package it, you could not brand it. And uh, to this day, it's very difficult to go in the Europe and see a bag that says product of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, a shrimp. It's more likely you'll find a bag of shrimp with a different label on it, with on the back sourced from Canada. So uh, there was a lot of work went into this on this side of the uh, negotiations. Uh, at the end of the day, all of Newfoundland's uh, fish and seafood products that we currently export to the European Union will be going to duty free immediately on day one of this agreement. Uh, that was accomplished through uh, various ways. Uh, in some cases, the immediate removal of a tariff. In other instances, for shrimp, for example, as well as codfish, there were agreements to reduce the tariff over phase out periods of uh, one to seven years. But there were special uh, tariff rate quotas negotiated between the federal government and the European Union to allow all of the product that Newfoundland really can source uh, uh, to go into the European Union duty free. And uh, that was. Tremendous value in a number of ways. In immediate tariff relief is 25 to 35 million dollars, and estimates of you know 100 million dollars annually to the, to, the, to the sector in the province. So there, are, you know, it's uh, certainly, uh, and we were in partnership with industry the whole way on that. Uh, the next sector, forestry and wood products, something that uh, the government, quite frankly, and my minister are looking at very intensively try to develop in the province all forestry and wood products and processed wood products. Uh, and there's a very big market for processed wood products in Europe, particularly wood pellets and the like, all go to duty free immediately. <coughs> Government procurement uh, is the next issue. And then Steve talked a little bit about this. And this kind of goes into my next slide, talking about uh, trade and services. I mean, this is a sector where uh, 
Newfoundland companies, in particular in the knowledge-based companies and in, in a number of offshore oil and gas sectors, those type of knowledge-driven sectors, there are a lot of opportunities in Europe. And having guaranteed access and guaranteed access that we know, you know, and having the commitment that no one will ever get any better access uh, is a really good thing from a, uh, from a, from a trade and a, from a business point of view. Uh, there are, you know, getting government procurement contracts in Europe can be a difficult thing. And I'm going to come back to that sort of, uh, 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 sort of implementation issue and taking advantage of the opportunity issue at the end. Uh, but we do recognize that there are going to be some, uh, uh, you know, creating an opportunity and realizing that are, are two fundamental things. The next slide uh, on non-tariff barriers. This is, as Steve said, I think, the fundamental defining feature of CETA which makes it fundamentally different than any other trade agreement uh, in multiple ways. Steve mentioned a couple of them. One would be the conform conformity assessment and the ability, and this is a prohibitive restraint on doing business in Europe, having to get products uh, uh, assessed in Europe to European standards. In some cases, across the country, it was impacting everyone, and business had identified it as a significant financial cost. Uh, this will now be removed. Uh, but there are also other things like the agreement to uh, uh, on uh, the, sorry the chapter on the recognition of mutual qualifications, and this will allow uh, <clears throat> a, a number of uh, uh, industry players to really take advantage of CETA because one of the most difficult things, and to some of the scholars in the room who study the European Union know, when the European Union integrated, they struggled with this issue. Okay, it's one thing to say you can operate as a professional service provider across the EU. It's another thing to go in there and actually get certified to do it because a teacher is not a teacher in every member state. They overcame that, but outside of the EU and in economic relations with the EU, they don't have any other partnerships like they've done internally in the EU, except for now CETA, where there is a chapter that allows national associations in Canada and the national associations in Europe or the EU association come together uh, to form a mutual recognition agreement, which would give automatic, automatic recognition to professional service providers in Canada, such as engineers, architects, uh, and, either, and even further down the line. So the opportunity is there for there to be real sort of labor uh, mobility. And without labor mobility, you can't have uh, economic integration, and you can't have sort of the realization of a lot of these benefits. Uh, on the other side of it, uh, you know, in, in all the conversations I have around CETA or, you know, just trade policy more generally, the issue of non-tariff barriers and uh, ha having been able to deal with them is a fundamental problem. And what CETA does is opens up a number of channels that don't exist at the moment to effectively deal with them. Uh, and as Steve said, one of the things that's coming out of CETA, uh, he mentioned that provinces participating in the negotiations. Uh, they will also be participa participating formally as members of the Canadian delegation in the structures of the European Union. So that will allow uh, provincial officials and territorial officials to have their voice heard on what's specifically important to their jurisdictions. And that has never happened before in the history of confederation. So uh, that, at least from a provincial territorial viewpoint, is very important because we will be able to work directly both with the federal government but the EU to uh, deal with those sort of daily issues. As my colleagues in trade policy know, that's what we spend most of our time on. And having those frameworks in place through an agreement which institutionalizes that is uh, very effective. Now more generally on trade and services, uh, and I won't go through all of this, but for Newfoundland and Labrador, this was really outside of the goods issues. This was our objective in this agreement. And I'll come back to, because I, I know in some of your minds there's going to be questions about what is the impact of this, but we wanted an agreement that was ambitious in this sector because of the investment in service sector in the economy for professional service providers that goes across the entire economy. And their ability to export those services uh, is important and be able to collaborate, to be able to go to Europe, for example, to sell a service, uh, you need to be able to return. So there's a whole range of things in this sort of umbrella, or sorry, basket, uh, uh, that guarantees that Newfoundland service providers across the board will have the best access 
to the most lucrative services market in the world. And this includes, in some cases, the ability to operate without a work permit uh, on selected sectors. Uh, uh, I don't have the list here in front of me, but these were priorities for Canada, and they're mostly in the high tech, ocean tech, uh, IT sectors. Uh, and this is an area where the province has uh, invested heavily and has uh, been identified as a strategic sector. So I, I went ahead of myself a little bit. This is the uh, temporary, temporary entry provisions I was talking about. And this doesn't fundamentally change immigration policy or anything like that. And it doesn't give anybody a right to work anywhere. But what it does do is in the cases where uh, it's desired, and people are investing and they need those collaborative relationships, it's just easier to do business. And this has been identified numerous times. We heard it this morning, many times in the business community, as a major factor in uh, uh, both bilateral trade with the European Union and every country. On investment, uh, you know, this is sort of a very broad slide here. Uh, there's sort of really two angles to investment. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, we don't have a lot of huge investors that go outside, as you would see from Central Canada and other places. But we do have investments in Europe, and those investments need to be protected. This agreement provides with that protection. On the other hand, it does provide a stable investment market in the province, and it is something that investors look to more and more. And having an agreement will undoubtedly, as we've seen from other trade agreements, lead to more investment. So as a sort of a general principle, the agreement will facilitate that. Now, see the head the next steps. But what I want to go back to, you know, because this is, we have, we're going to have a discussion here, is there's no real slides in here, because this was a presentation on the technical aspect of CETA, and we can answer any questions you want, particularly Steve, so, uh, on every excruciating detail of this 9,000 page agreement. However, the other side is, and this is an obvious question, is, well, what impact does it have on the province? What did the province skip up? So I'll deal with that issue right now. Uh, across the agreement, uh, the province did have to take on obligations. 99% of them were obligations that were already existed under Canada's free trade agreements or were consistent with provincial public policy. Uh, there was a, uh, 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 a decision to uh, eliminate minimum processing requirements after three years when the agreement comes into force. Uh, however, on the investment side, uh, the key economic policies in the natural resource sector, there's not one policy will be changed or given up as a product of this agreement. They've all been reserved through the negative listing that Steve talked about. Uh, this gives him bad memories because we didn't always get along on what should be in those things. Uh, but it was a condition and it was the mandate the entire time that all major key economic policies and investment be protected. Uh, so we don't, for example, there's nothing that changes in provincial government procurement practices. There's nothing in this agreement that erodes the Atlantic Accords or any of the policies with the offshore. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there so, uh, you know, because we as a province did make a government procurement offer. We did agree to certain restrictions around investment. So. For example, uh, if we don't have an exemption or an exception, there are limitations in terms to be consistent with the agreement, what you can do to foreign investment. But forestry, agriculture, fisheries and aquaculture, uh, oil and gas, electricity, uh, were all carved out in broad sectoral ex exemptions to the investment obligation, so we have control over foreign investment in those sectors. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm to. Uh, I, I would say that I, this is industry and academia and everybody here. Uh, this is sort of a start of a process where we're going to be uh, 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 not advertising CETA as much as helping people understand CETA because it is an extremely complex agreement. And when we discuss this agreement, for example, and its impact on business and so forth, uh, things like rules of origin, there's a 9,000 page book that explains what every good is and what you're allowed to do with that good. And what does that mean? Uh, you know, when is a fish a Canadian fish? I thought it was very simple, but it's not actually that simple. Uh, and you know, it's funny because in Europe, they went through this. They had to determine what a product was. And a trade negotiation was the same thing. Like literally people like, that's not a halibut. And like you see people have these conversations. Uh, 
So there's going to be an effort to uh, uh, share that knowledge and you know develop the resources and the tools and the mechanisms so that people can take advantage of, of the opportunities that are coming out of the agreement. Uh, so that's all I have to say. So make sure we got a bit of time to ask questions. I was going to go the whole time so no one asked any questions, but <laughs> I figured that would. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Steve and Jeff, uh, for a great presentation. <clears throat> Uh, I just have one quick question in terms of process. Do the provinces and territories need to ratify or only the national, only the federal government? No, the federal government has exclusive constitutional responsibility for international treaties, so they don't need to formally ratify. So we won't see an act in the House of Assembly here to get it passed? Uh, that's up to each province, actually. Um, mm -hmm. They can decide. They clearly have to make some changes to policy, perhaps legislation, regulations. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how they want to put it through. 